There we go. I often forget that step. So Beth Trusansky, Deputy Director of Building Bright Futures, it's great to have you here. Really psyched to have Matthew and Lauren um, joining us from the Office of the Child, Youth and Family Advocate uh, to talk a little bit about their work um, and recommendations over the last year-ish. Maybe it's been a little bit more than a year. And um, for us to hear a, a little bit about their work, have some discussion and ultimately see if there are recommendations that we as the Child Outcomes Accountability Team want to elevate um, towards um, the State Advisory Council's policy recommendations uh, for the next year. The, that is kind of the time of year that we are in. Um, so I will invite folks to make recommend or make introductions in the chat. Um, uh, we are thrilled to have you here. Again, this is really a cross-sector group that stewards goal one of the VCAP, which is all children have a healthy start. And there's so much to that goal. Um, and this group tends to really talk about the intersection of child and family health, early childhood, uh, social determinants of health, um, and, and those, those pieces. So um, I think we're right at the heart of that to, in today's discussion. So I'm gonna pause and see if there's any, any openings that I'm missing, any intros. Okay, so I'm gonna hand this over to Matthew and Lauren. They're gonna share a little bit about the work that they've been doing. Um, we can keep this fairly informal. If you have questions, you know, Matthew said, just jump in um, and we, we um, will um, have uh, discussion and recommendations. I do also want to note that we know that this meeting, there's a little bit of overlap and conflict with the uh, panel that BBF is hosting with family leaders. And so if there's an opportunity to end a little bit early, we will do that so you can migrate over to that. However, both meetings are being recorded, so you, you won't miss out. So with that, Matthew and Lauren, thanks for being here. Um, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'm just going to hopefully not merely attempt, but actually succeed in sharing a PowerPoint real quick or a presentation. But um, um, while I'm doing that, um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Matthew Bernstein. Um, I am a, um, I was a teacher, um, a high school teacher and um, approached this work and, and also studied history. I have a master's in history and approached this work kind of through us, not kind of, but through a social justice lens um, and a lifetime of trying to think about how to, um, how to work for justice essentially and found sort of stumbled into child welfare after law school just knowing I wanted to work with kids so I, I went to law school knowing I went wanted to work with kids and then um found child welfare and kind of fell in love and, and never looked back so I am a an educator um an attorney and um the first child advocate and have um, Lauren and I are charged with setting up this office. So um, uh, I'll pass it to Lauren to, to introduce um, yourself and then I'll try to get this PowerPoint up here. Sounds good. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Higby, Deputy Advocate with OCYFA, Office of the Child, Youth and Family Advocate. Um, just completed my first year in this role. Um, prior to that, I was deputy licensing director at the Cannabis Control Board. So I was like, oh, let's go try something new because previously I was with DCF Family Services Division in Residential Licensing and Special Investigations Unit, RLSI, um, and worked on licensing, regulating residential treatment programs commissioner designated shelters or youth shelters, and then child placing agencies, both private foster care and adoption agencies. Um, previous to that, I worked with a VCRIP program um, in Brattleboro Youth Services, which is now Interaction. VCRIP is Vermont Coalition of Runaway and Homeless Youth Programs. Um, but other than that, I worked in child welfare in Philadelphia and in Chicago. Um, and 
and much like Matthew said, my first internship at a small foster care agency on the south side of Chicago just sealed sealed my fate. So I was <laughs> in it forever. Um, and every time I try to leave, I get pulled right <laughs> back. So nice to be here. All right. Thank you, Lauren. So, um, oh boy. So I'm going to make sure that this is working correctly. Let's see here. If I go to slideshow here. All right. So are you all seeing just this big slide here? Okay. I'm a little, yeah, Zoom is, Zoom screen sharing is a little, still a little foreign to me and maybe always will be. Anyway. Okay. So, um, so this is us. We have a, a, a long name that people, um, uh, you can just think of us as the office of the child advocate. That's the simplest way. Um, and we are we are child and youth centered. So uh, advocating for children and going outwards towards the community. So here's a little agenda um, for reference later. Okay, so this is um, this office was set up by statute by um, in 2022. The governor signed the bill that. Um, created this office, which I, you know, I think is important, honestly. Um, and uh, so here is our charge. Um, oopsies, sorry about that. What I need to do is minimize you all because you're in the way of my slides. Okay. I don't know how to do that. Um, every time I, do you, all, do you all know how to minimize the, on the side, the little, um, the little boxes? Oh, I guess I can go up here. Right, so perhaps if you go to the top right, there's a view option. Perhaps, perhaps there is. Uh, I'll just deal with it. So, um, so, so this is our statutory purpose, and essentially our mandate and, and the folks we work with is in one, two, and three on this page. So it's um, children and youth receiving services from the department, and that is DCF, all divisions of DCF, or through funds provided by the department. And then number two, those involved in the child protection system and those involved in the juvenile justice system. So essentially it's children, youth, and families receiving services from the from DCF directly or through funds provided by DCF. So that, that is a large mandate, as, as you can tell. Um, numbers two and three here, child protection and juvenile justice. Um, my interpretation of this statute is that they, um, that's, the, that's the core of our work. So while technically we work with folks who are struggling with child support issues, and we, we have, um, you know, we could spend all of our time doing that and not have any time to do child protection and juvenile justice. And I guess we should have said, Lauren and I are the only two full-time employees um, of this office and we have asked for more employees, but so far um, the legislature has not uh, chosen to fund that. Um, and so we have to choose very carefully uh, what we work on and constantly triage and prioritize. Uh, but that is our mandate, um, which I think is great. Of course, like having a broad mandate, I think is is important and um, and is and is good in so many ways. Um, it's a little frustrating to kind of instantly become another state agency complaining about lack of funding and and resources. So um, I and we try not to do that. We try to just focus on the work we can do, and um, I think we've we've done a lot and and, and will continue to do a lot. Um, but maybe in a practical sense, if you reach out to us and don't hear back, definitely follow up because we're dealing with a lot. So anyway, um, here is what we shall do, and the statute says shall, um, work in collaboration to strengthen services for children and families, analyze and monitor developments in federal, state, and local law and policy, and recommend changes when appropriate, um, receive and respond to complaints, as the statute puts it, we call them referrals, um, inform, because, you know, that puts a negative spin on it, and sometimes folks, um, you know, sometimes there are you know, there are people who are looking for something that is not necessarily framed negatively, although quite frequently we do hear complaints. Um, inform children, youth, and families regarding their rights and responsibilities, which is really important. Um, provide systemic information um, concerning child, youth, and family welfare to the public, the governor, state agencies, the legislature, and others. Um, you know, really important. We see ourselves as 
Um, I mean, we are always learning. We we are we are not um, instantly wise and always correct, but we are um, a center for best practices and um, you know for for knowledge and and uh, you know by a center I mean knowledge flows through us, right? Your the knowledge of you all and of the community and of other experts and of people with lived experience and of youth themselves and even you know six month old babies. Um, you know we we try to bring that to you know, these entities, uh, the legislature, the governor, et cetera, because as you know, uh, there is always room for more, um, there's always room for more voice from children, youth and families. Um, and then number six is submitted an annual report, which we'll talk about in just one second. So if I start going too fast, or if even if not, and you just have a question, please just raise your hand and maybe somebody else, if I don't see a hand, will tell me that it's there because Apparently I'm old and don't know how to use Zoom. Um, okay, so this is just one example of some of the powers we have, um, which which is maybe the most important example of what this office actually does. Um, oh, and I should have said, we did have a slide in here that I guess somehow fell out about, we are, so we are, it may be obvious, but we are part of the state of Vermont, right? This logo, the Moon Over Mountains logo is on our slides, right? We are a state entity, we are state employees, but we are, outside of the chain of command of DCF. We are outside of the Agency of Human Services. Um, we are independent, which is, you know, not really a thing in state government, um, uh, sort of uh, administratively state government is, struggles with this. Um, sometimes it comes down to like, are we on a little drop down thing for, you know, us to submit our billing or whatever. Um, but it also is very serious and really truly means something um, because we, you know, the whole point of this office is that we are an independent advocate and there are some protections on, um, on, on us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm appointed for a four year term, uh, um, nominated by the governor, confirmed by the Senate, and then can be removed essentially only for cause. At the end of the four-year term, the governor can appoint somebody new, and then Lauren is an employee of this office, and um, you know, depending on who the like, sort of serves at the pleasure of the advocate. Um, and I'm quite happy she's here. Um, okay, so here is one important power that we have related to our independence, and um, you know, we don't have subpoena power, but what we do have is um, essentially we're essentially inside the confidentiality bubble, so you know, we can and do um, every day. Uh, email DCF and say there's this there's these folks who've reached out to us um, and please send us all of your records about um, you know your 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 investigation your child safety investigation of uh, X Y Z parents um, and they they do they send us everything we are in the process and this falls under a million things happening and it's been very very slow but we are close to having an MOU so we actually have direct access and a login to the DCF um, information systems, uh, SSMIS and FSDNet and the others that are uh, quite ancient, but nonetheless, um, uh, it, you know, crucial every day, you know, the systems that the workers use to take notes, et cetera. That direct access is, um, is crucial and we are, um, we are, you know, I think it, it will be very important to have that access because, you um, it's, I mean, it's it's more efficient, but also it, it allows us to look into matters without having to go through DCF first. Um, they are very, and we have committed to continuing the communication with them to make sure that, um, you know, when we, if we are looking into something, they have a chance to sort of respond and provide their perspective and information. And I think, you know, we are collaborative as the previous slide says, so. Um, so there is that, but we also, um, you know, we also have a right to records and information, and we can also um, visit with youth privately. Um, we also can visit facilities as well, which is that on the next slide. Um, yes. Uh, so um, if a child is not in DCF custody, we the statute says we need to get the consent of their um, parent or guardian to visit with them privately. If they are in DCF custody, we don't need anybody's permission, and we can just visit with them. And then um, C on this slide is, um, you know, I see this as somewhat similar to the protection and advocacy rights. If you're familiar with like, you know, disability rights Vermont, every state has a protection and advocacy entity, which has this similar um, statutory right to access um, facilities. So in theory, we could go down to the Brattleboro retreat tomorrow or today and just say, um, you know, we, we, we should state our reasons, but, you know, somebody has reached out to us 
they've said they're struggling with an issue related to the where they are you know we'd like to we'd like to um, meet with them in their private room right now or something like that and the the entity should not say under the law um, you can't come in you don't have any right to come in um, so another important power um and then there are these required reports from dcf to our office um essentially actual physical injury or significant risk of such this is this is for children in dcf custody um only so instances of restraint and seclusion and then rules around fatalities um I will say this is a part of the law that is that is I wouldn't say essentially non-functional. And number one, the actual physical injury, there is a there is a system that is functioning for that. Um, number three, luckily, um, you know, knock on wood, there have there have been um, no fatalities since this office has been in existence of children in custody. Um, but number two here on this slide, restraint and seclusion. This part this part of the statute is essentially non-functioning. DCF has has um, they have gotten us two batches of data since the creation of this office, um, but it's not meaningful, accurate, um, helpful, uh, doesn't get to the meaning of the statute. In other words, you know, this statute exists so that so that our office can both understand what's going on, um, you know, in terms of restraint and seclusion of children in custody across hospital settings, residential treatment, schools, unlicensed settings such as staffings, um, and also inform the public as well about in, in the aggregate about what's going on, right? And um, I think, you know, some of it is, is, is there, there are some good reasons why this reporting has not happened, but I will say um, that DCF has not made it a priority and, um, you know, right now with two people, we, again, we could spend all of our time on that, you know, sort of logistical piece and pushing them to, to do what they are already required to do by law. Um, and, you know, we have done some of that, but we, again, have to choose um, how we spend our time. And I will say, uh, the le this is really, I think, falls on the legislature to enforce um, the statute that it passed. Um, and, um, you know, as you can hear, it's a little bit frustrating, but, um, you know, we can talk about that uh, in a different context. And, and of course, we have informed the legislature of this um, repeatedly. So um, that's a that's that's a hard uh, that's a negative point in. In our existence so far. Um, and then here is what is required in the annual report, which we'll talk about our first one in just a second. Um, conditions of placements for children and youth. Um, Sorry, I should start at the beginning. So each December 1st, we shall submit to the governor and the General Assembly, aka the legislature, a report addressing services provided by the department, again, that's DCF, including conditions of placements for Vermont's children and youth, findings related to services for and assistance to children, youth, and families within the child protection and juvenile justice systems, recommendations for improving those services, and then data um, disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender, uh, geographic area, disability status, and any other categories. Um, and I will say, just because we haven't mentioned it so far, um, you know, racial justice is a centerpiece of what we want to do. Um, disability rights are hugely important, and um, you know, and I and in child welfare, gender is is obviously um, massively important as well, um, and so. You know, I think I just wanted to flag that here, and, and in our report, we we give a lot of um, data um, about those um, based on uh, disaggregated, as it says, by those um, attributes. And um, you know, if you I think one message to you all is that um, the you know this is this is the social you know as we said at the beginning, the, the social justice, loosely speaking, parts of child welfare are immensely important and continue to be. If you look at our juvenile justice policy, for example. Um, uh, it is, it is, you know, not just, it doesn't just implicate, you know, the last 200 years of Vermont and, and the United States history, but it is, it is, that history just lives, you know, uh, still in, you know, for example, they're, they're proposing to build a, you know, this locked juvenile facility on the site of the Vermont reform school, um, you know, where children did hard labor, a uh, hundred years ago. So, um, that is a very important part of our mission. So, okay. 
we have we have done one annual report so far. Um, so we've been in existence since um, technically since January first, two thousand and twenty three. Um, I started just because of hiring and you know logistical issues at the end of February twenty twenty three. Lauren came on just a little over a year ago in June of 2023. Um, and so our first annual report was in uh, December of 2023. And I, I include it, you know, uh, Kate linked, linked it in the um, agenda. And there's a, there's a uh, what is it called? Executive summary. Um, and the full report is 80 something pages. But I do think that so it's it's long. I and we were ambitious with the first one, especially. Um, but I but I what I'm proud of is each of these sections that you see here. Um they're each, I mean, it's written in, oh, here come the jets, of course. Um it is written in uh you can hear that, but I sure can. I'll get my headphones uh, if it gets too bad. Um, it is written in, in, you know, plain language. And, you know, one thing that I guess I wanted to say as a sort of overall piece of feedback is I think the fewer acronyms, <laughs> Lauren, how loud is that? Can you hear that? It more jumbled from you than anything. More like affecting that. me, I think so. Okay. Um, is just is just you know being clear about what's at stake here and trying not to talk in acronyms because I think one huge problem um, with what's happened in the child welfare system everywhere but also in Vermont is um, and I you know we've been experiencing this this week right and all the time is just the amount of sort of administrative terminology and kind of bureaucracy and like procedure that really um, you know gets in the way of of what's truly important which is you know healthy, strong, and happy uh, kids, right? So um, so anyway, here, here's this sort of conditions of placement, and um, and then we have a findings and recommendations section. Yeah. I lost the presentation. I'm not sure if others can see it still. I can see it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so I'm looking at the time and think we, I think we should move a little faster. Um, so... Um, we can come back to some of these themes um, in a second, um, you know, and, and so you can use the links that Kate sent out to um, check out more about each of these systems if they interest you. Um, and I'm just going to skip through. This kind of goes into more detail about the annual report. I guess I'll just say briefly that um, that you know, bringing more federal money to Vermont for child welfare is is central, is sort of the number one thing in terms of the big systemic stuff, you know, in terms of the systemic advocacy we do, as opposed to the individual advocacy we do. And um, there is so much we could be doing right now. Um, federal law, it's a uniquely bipartisan issue, um, child welfare, you know, so, somewhat surprisingly, um, and, you know, even even no matter which way if the election goes in this year, um, you know, unless something huge changes, Title IV of the Social Security Act will still be an un, a, a, a huge uncapped, in, a, a fundamental uncapped entitlement. It's an, eight, I think, $800 billion program nationwide. It's an uncapped entitlement that uh, funds various creative, increasingly creative programs in child welfare. And so if you only take away one thing on a systemic level, it is that, and there is a lot of detail there that I will not go into right now, but a lot of it's in our report. Um, okay, and so now I'm gonna hand this off to Lauren to talk about um, children, children prenatal to eight and kind of you know what we've been seeing. Um, and Lauren, the Jets may get to where you are you know, <laughs> just to start talking, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to hit mute and um, and uh, and hand it over to you. Yeah, sometimes they make it, but they usually like to be much higher once they reach me, yeah. so it's not as as loud. I just hope the internet continues. Um, yeah, I of course wanted to add forty seven billion themes and recommendations, um, but then there was the focus of the age range um, and and all of the charge that I appreciate 
um, the meeting started with. Um, and I think an interesting um, development we have found, and it's we have DCF fully on board, is um, really the need to enhance economic supports for children and families involved with child welfare and juvenile justice. But one development that came out of that was um, children in DCF custody that receive Social Security Administration administration, SSA, or SSI benefits. Um, in those instances, DCF has become the payee. And so the funds that should be awarded or saved for the child or used for the child, we're going to pay essentially for their foster care. Um, and, and that is um, a growing movement nationally to change that because other states um, have that similar practice. Um, and those benefits are sometimes related to survivor benefits of a if a parent is deceased or um, if the child has um, some special needs that re requires additional supports. Um, so it has been really promising to meet with DCF um, about that. And essentially, um, for some reason, I lost what I, there it is. Um, DCF worked to get our office the data that we requested. So there are 41 children and, um, receiving SSA benefits with DCF as the payee, 18 children receiving SSI benefits with DCF as the payee. Um, and then there are 13 children that are in the process of becoming eligible for those benefits or restarting those benefits where DCF is the payee. So it accounts for about 71 children in DCF custody but it's valued at around just over $600,000 of money. Um, it should be used for the children that are actually being used to pay for their foster care. Um, and there's some interesting and, and promising work groups happening um, to, um, sorry, I just saw the chat and then I get distracted. Um, yep, the commissioner, deputy commissioner, and um, I don't know her title, the, the money people, right, um, at, <laughs> in FSD. Um, and so it's it's been, I think, a fairly promising um, conversation to have those benefits. There's still, like, a bunch of structures and, like, logistical stuff to work out, Um but that has been one example of some great partnership there. Um, I think, Dora, there is a current policy um, in terms of screening for benefits for all children that are coming into custody, um, but I would have to refer to the DCF policy. But I think there's some general um, process on the books, and I'm not entirely sure. Um, <clears throat> so, and um, I think another theme that's coming out, I'll just read through it. Um, that's, they're all the ones that are currently swirling in my head right now, right? Um, of that children and youth that have aged out of DCF custody and now have their children having some level of DCF involvement. Um, I've seen that in terms of youth that age directly out of residential programs to homelessness. I've seen it for youth that are in the hotels as part of the COVID-19 cohort. Um, and I think there's, there's an interesting opportunity there to create some sort of both quantitative and qualitative analysis on, on how um, impactful DCF involvement is really being and, and transformative and how are we reducing recidivism um, and, and that uh, 
almost, you know, that bias that, oh, this family's known to the department, or I, we know that family, that sort of adage. Um, um, oh, Matthew, how dare you? <laughs> um, and I just, this kind of just coalesced this morning, actually, in my head in terms of the importance of summer programming. And that could be like, because I am a parent and it's summer camp chaos, right? And then also as a previous regulator, camp is terrifying because it's the most unregulated space that we send children. And can I just throw up about that? Um, anyway, most camps are great. Um, but what I've been seeing is that summer programming is impacting a child's availability to return to kinship placement from resident right so like how do we support a a kid returning home or to a kin provider and have the necessary supports before school starts in August or September for example um, I think we also have seen it in terms of if there's a school-aged child or even a kid in daycare and there isn't consistent summer programming but we need to have some additional supports for safety planning purposes, how, what is available for the child and for the family. Um, and then an another example we saw was there was um, a young child, I think four or five, um, and the daycare saw uh, the importance of having a one-on-one -on -one support for him, but the, um, the funding had run out, there wasn't additional summer programming, so they had to write a special grant in order to have sufficient summer programming for this child. Um, so I would call that an emerging theme because it, like I said, it's starting to coalesce in my head, but I, I really think it's a, an overlap in, in our work here. Um, and Another large, huge, ongoing, unending theme um, is the issue with parent-child visitation and, and how we integrate youth voice, child voice into that. Even, I know probably not prenatal is going to use a child voice, but right, like an eight-year-old will be very verbal in some instances about who they want to visit with, who they do not want to visit with. Um, and I, we're, we're seeing that in terms of how, how do we have safe parent-child visitation and contact both in family court and in domestic dockets, so outside of the CHIN system. Um, and that has, I, I have been surprised at how many families have contacted our office, like through divorce proceedings or um custody battles trying to navigate an appropriate child visit parent child visitation program um with or without dcf involvement um and i i really think there are ways for our system to integrate the youth of the use of child voice in a way that is not traumatizing i think this, this theory, this idea that has kind of permeated the system that any child testifying is is going to, you know, traumatize them to the end of time. Like, I, I think we, we need to reevaluate that sentiment um, and, and find creative solutions um, to really hear what the children want. Um, similar to summer programming, I think the limitation on... Um, PCP and this psychiatry wait list is also impacting transition. So when we have children that we want to get out of a uh, residential program or an acute um, inpatient unit, the emergency department, there, there are some challenges in terms of the timeliness and in the support a family could have given those wait lists. Um, I'm checking the chat. Hey, Lauren, what's PCP? Just in case. Uh, primary care physician. Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Um, 
And another point that we've sort of connected about um, is the restraint and seclusion, lack of reporting. And um, given my time at Residential Licensing and Special Investigations Unit, I think it, we have to just acknowledge and accept that children up to age of eight or eight and below are being restrained, even if we call that a physical escort um, or it's not, you know, there there are ways that the children are being restrained inside regulated settings and outside regulated settings. Um, I reached out to AOE to try to understand the Agency of Education, I'm sure you know that, but just for the recording too, um, in terms of like, how do they track restraint and seclusion of children in DCF custody? And they said they do not. Um, so that's a bit problematic because I think there's also some assumptions that come with restraint and seclusion of like only kids in residential are going to be restrained or experience seclusion when really across multiple settings children could have that experience um, based on the varying definitions and regulatory oversight of those settings. Um, so I think really for Vermont to understand the significant amount of times that children are being restrained and secluded. We should really advocate for some um, common language, common definitions and reporting and data collection so we can move from there. Um, and then what I'm excited about for our office too is some analysis that we're doing with emergency staffings that DCF is completing. And so those um, are unlicensed and unregulated spaces that children in custody are living in for, you know, zero to, I mean, they can be days on end um, and they're staffed by family services workers or whomever. Um, there are other people that staff and unclear to like who those other people are. Um, but my hypothesis, and I call it that because we haven't finished our analysis, is that the, the children that are experienced this disruption in placement, disruption in education, in peer support, in community involvement, in, in family contact, are also going to be the youth that are really struggling later on in life. And so I, I bring that up to, to this group um, because there are children, I think the youngest I saw was five years old that were in the unlicensed, unregulated emergency staffing situation. Um, and so it's, it's definitely relevant um, for this group. Okay, is there a deal? Lauren, sorry, I, I just, just to jump in on that real quick, and I realize mm -hmm. we're pretty much out of time too, but um, and I'll find this link and put it in the chat, but um, this staffing, if you hear about staffings or you know about staffings, I would just urge um, everyone out there, <laughs> anybody in the world who hears about a staffing, um, especially of a young child, to just just pull on that thread, ask what's going on, what's how the child's doing, what kind of services they have, because these are, I mean, the, this is the, it, it, it really, I mean, it is, it is, it gets, it gets me, I can only speak for myself, so fired up because it is the most um, unacceptable. I don't know about the most, it is, it is, it is completely unacceptable that we're doing this to children because what we are doing is, essentially warehousing children who are who have disabilities who have mental health needs who have trauma who have suffered trauma and we are putting them isolating them segregating them um again long history of this in this state um and elsewhere with no services no education no peer connection um no real um you know evidence-based support and um, the notion is that it's for their safety. I think that is what is so infuriating. 
And there is a draft policy that DCF is working on right now. And technically the deadline is passed for submission of comments, but the deadline doesn't pass because you know this is an ongoing, this they are increasingly using this technique because they they don't have anything else to do. And um, you know, for there, so anyway, I will we'll put this in the chat. It's worth reading because it is it truly it says in plain language that the goal of this is to meet the business needs of the department. That's what it says, and that is true. Um, it is it is to well, it's true except it's not true because it is it is also expensive in terms of dollars, and, and so um, I will stop because otherwise we'll be here all day. But I will put this in the chat and please um, please read it and comment if you want. But um, sorry, Lauren. And and yeah, now that we have even less time, negative time, back to you. Should should we just like wrap this up right this second, you all? I mean, it would be nice Question. to have a little bit of discussion. But yeah. um, when you ask it, us, <laughs> when you ask us to introduce ourselves, this is what happens. Uh, uh, apologies. No, it's okay. We're we don't have a hard stop of nine forty five. It's just the ability to transition to discussion. So I think what you're sharing is Let's... important and important background. And if you want to finish with these recommendations, and there's been some questions and dialogue in the chat, which I think is great. Awesome. So I'll hand it back to you, Lauren, to to do what you want to do. And um, what I want to do. Chat. Um, what is that? Um, I, I mean, in terms of some great promise, there's um new guidance or a new kinship rule from the the feds um which really allows for more flexibility in interpretation of kinship rules so how we would license family members to care for children and youth in dcf custody um which is exciting i think there's been some barriers um for licensing kin um, in Vermont, and 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 many of them, well, not many. I can't say many of them. Some of them have come to ask for help in our office, so that's been um, illuminating. And I think there's intent for DCF to rewrite um, those kinship rules. I I think um, that is a theme as well um, in terms of this population and if we're thinking of emergency staffings, restraint and seclusion, kinship rules, um, really we, we need to have a push across DCF to update their regulations of, of all regulated settings. Um, and that is, it's a complicated process, but I think really um, what, what we have learned um, from Woodside and, and other tragedies, right, is that even regulated settings, when the system is working to have oversight, there are shortfalls. Um, and one one way that we can um, work towards a better system is, is to have it working for the children and youth directly and not for the people administering the programs or the adults working in the system i can say it that way well and, um, and our point about that has been that actually if you look through the eyes of the child you actually do both right you actually meet if if, if children are doing better in the system right if they have their basic needs met if they're not being warehoused and isolated it actually does make things better for the people for the adults working with them right and this this frankly myopic focus on you know, staff safety, um, staff safety is crucial and important and, and has, you know, there has been great danger, including death to, to DCF staff. And that is absolutely essential. And the way to improve things for staff is to be child centered and go outward. And that also makes things better for, for the adults. So I said, I would stop. So now I will, I can't. You don't have Matthew, you can talk about mandatory reporting if you want, because I no, I think we should. I want to report I mean, forever. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, you know, Vermont is um, number one in the country in um, per capita mandatory reports, and um, I think there's been a longstanding notion that um, 
you know, that it's that that it's only to the good to have very, very stringent mandatory reporting um, statutes and also the trainings and, and which has been a problematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the mm -hmm. the current trainings actually, I, I think, misstate the, what the actual law is. And I think um, I think the notion and it's really it's 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 also like a social norm thing in this um, in Vermont um, is that it's, you know, no, you know, just better safe than sorry. Report, report, report. And, um, you know, that's, that's, um, you know, I, I think that, that, that makes children more unsafe, that attitude. And I think, um, that is not sufficiently acknowledged. And so there has been though, and this, you know, this comes out of the legislature as well, you know, from a, what happens everywhere. And, you know, there's, there's good data on this, um, including from UVM, you know, that when there's a, a child death, then um, there is a strong response, but that response often makes children less safe, not not more safe, unfortunately. Um, so that's a whole other topic and um, for another day. But I, I want to stop, I think, and just hear from anybody, any feedback, questions, comments, because, you know, despite us having talked this whole time, we really, really, we really want your input and um, rely on folks like you to to really guide what this office does. Because, um, yeah, because I mean we're small and and it's it is it is hard to be connected to everybody and also just keep the lights on and get everything done we need to get done, especially with two people. So um, so please anybody jump in, raise your hand, or if it's just like it's like the hook pulling us off the stage now, that's that's totally fine too. Um, but Thanks for thanks for listening. <laughs> and I'm gonna stop screen sharing so that I can like use my computer fully because I am old, but also this technology is yeah. unworkable. Matthew and Lauren, you this is so so interesting, um, and also appreciate the approach that you're taking <laughs> to this work that is really intense, but um, you know, coming with a place of of compassion. So. Open it up to others. Yeah, if you want to pull down the screen share, that would be great. And Yeah, and I'll just show you that our contact information is on the last slide. I'll send this to you, Beth, and you can distribute it how you see fit. Um, so um, please reach out. So thanks. What 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 are we missing from our list um, from, from prenatal to eight? What's what's what? What are you wondering that we might that we might be thinking about more? Something that you expected to see that you didn't see on that list? We've already talked about this a little bit, but um, like plans of safe care and what um, like as we're talking about prenatal what supports for um, uh, pregnant people with uh, substance use disorder looks like. Yes, thank you, Dora. And we've talked about that separately. This was on the list somewhere. I actually don't know if it was on the slide, but yes, hugely important. We um, we are hoping to have our first annual conference in the fall, um, both one day of juvenile justice and one day um, child welfare, loosely speaking. And we're hoping to have a presentation about almost exactly that, Dora, um, but stay tuned. Yes, crucially important and a huge, huge, huge topic that honestly, I would love, you know, if we had another hour, I would love to hear more about your all's experience um, with that in Vermont, because um, I don't have a lot of experience with that here. I do in, in previous work I've done, um, and it's just so important. Hey, I just wanted to jump in really quick. And this is I'm Katie Luffel. I work for Family and Child Health Division. I'm here with Elena Robles. And um, one of the, just talking about the plan of safe care, we work a lot with maternal mortality prevention and also perinatal substance use and also intersect with the Family Services Division with some work um, with when children enter custody and making sure that they get adequate and timely medical um primary care visits. So we could, so this is very interesting to me, but with the plan of safe care, there's a lot of work being done currently around looking at updating it in and of itself, but then also pulling it back into the prenatal period, maybe having it be more of like a care plan kind of approach as opposed, as opposed to just, you know, strictly for 
um, more like the reporting piece of it, actually having it function as it's supposed to mm -hmm. function and um, looking at the, you know, more family ownership of it and things like that to making it a more useful document. So I would love to hear more at some point from you guys, not necessarily here, but um, connect in the future. Yeah, please reach out on that, Katie. I, I, we, we'd love to to talk about that. And I totally agree with what you're saying. And um, yeah, when, when I, you know, I, I'm not sure DCF, I mean, it depends on who you talk to, but I'm not sure DCF would agree with this following statement, which is when a department is in crisis, you know, and there are so many, there are so many boxes to check and so much regulation and, and so much paperwork when they are in crisis, at best meeting those that, that checking the boxes is what happens, whereas the actual, well, this is actually supposed to be for safe care and for, right, for the health of the child and the and the parents or the caregivers, right? Um, yes, that part can often fall off. And so um, hugely important, yes. We gotta get at least one more before we go, one more. Well, I think it's you, you had asked for what was missing, but I, I would also love if people, if, you know, how some of these topics relate to their work. You know, we have folks from Help Me Grow 211. We have folks from Head Start on the call, Department of Health, um, DCF Economic Services. Like we have actually a decent range of folks serving kids and families, or at least kind of holding systems that are serving kids and families and curious kind of what you see the intersection. No takers yet. People are quiet today. Sit in silence. What long do you enough. mean about intersection of our work with the office, or yeah, like what? Well, I mean, I th there is so much intersection with your work, Kaya. You know, yeah, there knowing is. that yeah, <laughs> work around um, trauma and resilience. Um, mm -hmm. So just just recognizing that there's there's rare opportunity for those of us across sector to talk about, you know child welfare um, and how we want to build a better system for kids and families. Um, yeah, and I think there is a lot of overlap between Matthew Lawrence and my work, but I also think we are sort of, we're all both offices or areas are standalone, so we've been all running at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> so some of those connections don't happen as easily as we would like. But if you need help planning your conference, if you're only two people, please tap me. I'd be happy to help. Thank you, Kaya. Yeah, I do feel like we're two ships passing in the night, Kaya, because we, we see you and we have a great conversation. And then, yes. well, when are we going to see you again? <laughs> for the offer, though, I really appreciate yeah. that and for the work you do. And um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. So um, others, please jump in. I guess I just wanted to say one thing because it's always... Um, it's always tricky to get to get the tone and the balance just right, but I just want to make clear that despite some of the you know potentially harsh words that I have had in this call about you know DCF systems um, and other state systems, not just DCF, you know we we truly do see um, everybody <laughs> you on this call, but also you know really DCF and and the folks who you know are working within these systems that that I you know, staffing kids, like these systems that, that I think are completely unacceptable, the people themselves who are doing the work every day, um, you know, I have utmost respect for everybody who works for DCF, no question. And, and you know, that is not, um, that is not to patronize them. It is truly to say, um, you know, our systems, it, it, is, it is incredibly hard to, to work um, within these systems and it is, we still need them to function in a most basic sense. We still need kids to be cared for. We need people to work for DCF directly with kids. Long-term, you know, would I like to see a different child welfare system? 
Yes, I would. But um, I think just 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 to separate our our approach is we we want to work with individuals and acknowledge humans and um, and and truly, you know, it, it really is um, a heart to heart connection with everybody because we have to do that to be able to to make to, to really achieve better, better outcomes for kids. Then we have to go big, right? Like we, um, I think one thing that, that drives me crazy is that we, we tend to sabotage our own power in this, right? We sort of say these systems must be this way because that's how they've been. Right. And, um, there is so much that we truly can do. And I think it's a lot really about the adults, you know, so often we point the finger at at children and say, you know, you got to do this, you got to step up, you know, you got to make better choices. But, um, you know, what I see in, in, you know, since I've been in this role is, is so much of it is, you know, adults and, and all of us and just the whole community, whatever label you want to put on people, realizing the power that we, that we truly do have to transform these systems and things do not have to, do not have to work poorly just because they've worked poorly for some amount of time. And um, it is not easy. <laughs> we, we, we don't transform things overnight, but, but we, the way we do transform them is by um, taking on the big ideas and by, you know, having the courage to envision a system that actually is better. Right. And so that's really what we want to do and, uh, and join us. So maybe with that, <laughs> we can, yeah. we can leave off. So. Yeah. Yeah. Ma Matthew, I couldn't agree more. And actually, I'm going to stop the recording. Um...